so now that we have discussed what are the conditional independence assumptions uh, expressed by a uh, graph structure we will do the next important thing about Bayesian network. So, now we are done with semantics. So, we were done with syntax earlier now we have looked at the semantics what does the network say what does the probabilistic graphical model say and that is called the uh, that semantics and now we will talk about inference ok. And what is inference? So, if you go back to logic the inference was I know something I am checking the value of something else and it is the same question I know something let us say I know evidence E and now I am interested in some query Z these are query variables and I want to know the probability of Z given E because it is a probabilistic model now I have to compute the probability in SAT I had to or in logic I had to figure out whether it is true false or unknown right. So, generally graphical independence assumptions makes better inference schemes as we shall see we can arrange our computations in the order of the graph. Uh, we often want to compute just the probability of z that is called the marginal probability ok. This is a specific word marginal probability which basically says I am not given any evidence. I just want to know what is the probability of some variable in the context of this full graph ok. And so, that is called the marginal probability more often than not we are interested in posterior probability. Posterior probability is if I give you some evidence E and then I want you to compute the probability of z given that I have given you E. So, that is the posterior distribution with respect to z and E is typically the conjunctive evidence. For example, I know this variable and that variable and that variable and I need to figure out what is the value of some other variable. Everything else is by the way a hidden variable. So, my variables in inference are of three kinds evidence, query and hidden. In this case z is the query variable, E is the evidence variable and everything else that we did not mention is the hidden variable and the main idea trick is that all the computations are going to be organized by network topology. And today we are going to do one such inference procedure called variable elimination and we will also learn the general principles of how to do inference in a Bayesian network. And we will do this with a specific example and this example would be what is the probability that there was burglary given that both John called and Mary called. So, my evidence is uh, I was having a party and suddenly John gave me a call and, and I left the party and uh, attended to his call and he said oh there is a there is an alarm. And I was like John is often drunk who cares etcetera etcetera and then suddenly uh, Mary also gives me a call saying Pearl come back home there is an alarm. And now I need to figure out whether it has been caused by burglary or earthquake or you know they were just hallucinating and so what do I do that is the question I need to ask and for that I need I will ask the question what is the probability of burglary given John called and Mary called and all the probability distributions that I was already aware of ok. So, this is the time everybody puts on their thinking caps because we will learn the procedure and this procedure will stay with you th throughout your life and go back to Mr. Bean's example where we said that the joint distribution can model everything and that is exactly what we are going to do first and then we will arrange the computations in the graphical network order ok. So, let us get started we are interested in B given J comma M ok and now what I am going to do in this slide only very carefully use upper case and lower case separately. So, lower case means that I know the value. So, I could have asked B given J comma not M whereas, upper case means I will have to deal with all possible values of that random variable ok. So, I am asking probability B given J comma M in other words I, in this notation I am saying what is the probability there was burglary and what is the probability there was no burglary given that John called and Mary called ok. So, J and M are lower case that means they are actual values not uh, a random variable everybody ok with the distinction right. Is this is a standard distinction in probability. So, if you have done a probability course you may have seen this before ok. And the first thing we are going to do is use the definition of conditional probability. So, that becomes P of B J M divided by P of J M ok. And if you have any questions on any step you should ask me because this is an important slide. This is a general principle of how to deal with this. The first thing we are going to do is that we will say that the denominator does not matter. Let us think about the denominator for a minute. Probability j comma m 
is a constant. I know J is true, M is true, I am not iterating over positives and negatives. That is a constant value with respect to what? Burglary true and burglary false. See what do we have to compute? We have to compute probability of burglary at the end of the day. And burglary can have two values, true or false. And for that what is going to change? The numerator is going to change with burglary true and burglary false. And in both such cases I will be divided by the same value. Because I will be divided by the same value, I let just say proportionality. We can simply say probability of B given J comma M is proportional to probability of B J M. And another way of saying proportionality is that it is some alpha times probability of B J M. That is the first step. You will see that in all conditional probabilities, because the evidence is given to us, the denominator does not matter. We just get rid of it and convert proportionality, equality to proportionality. The next step is the most important step which is where Mr. Bean comes in. <coughs> when I ask questions about a you know a particular variable what did you do? You summed up all the numbers where that particular thing was active. Now if you think about this particular graph how many variables do I have? 5. How many possible numbers will I have in the full joint distribution? Come on. How many possible numbers will I have in the full joint distribution? 32, right? Because 2 to the power 5, they are all possible combinations. And now, if I am interested in the probability Bjm, let us say I am interested in probability B is true, J is true, M is true, then how many numbers will indicate that? 4 numbers. One where earthquake is true alarm is false, one where earthquake is true, alarm is true and so on. So, we can write this down as a full joint distribution summing over the hidden variables. Okay? If you have come this far, then everything else is a piece of cake. This is the important step, this is again going back to Mr. B. There are all these numbers, I am interested in the query of something, there are many hidden variables whose values have been unspecified. We go to all the numbers where those hidden variables have been set some configuration and we add all of that, that gives me the probability of what I was interested in. This is also called marginalizing the hidden variable, this is also called summing over the hidden variable. So, we basically have to sum over hidden variables every time we give you a question like this. Now, life is simple because we know by the rule of the semantics of Bayesian network that a full joint distribution can be written down as, come on. In this case, probability B, E, A, J, M can be written down as probability of B times probability of E times probability of a given E B times probability of J given A and M given A. We will keep the upper case and lower case intact. This is for every Bayesian network, I mean this is a rule, right? The full joint distribution in a Bayesian network can always be computed by multiplying all the conditional probability tables in the topological order or in any order whatever. Notice that J and M have been kept lower case to indicate that those values are known to me and they are true in this case. And now we can do algebra and the algebra basically says does P of B depend on E and A? Well, I can push the summation inside. So, let us see how far can I push the summation. A will have to be pushed up to P of E and E will have to be pushed right after P of B, right. So, again this, this is uh, mathematics 101 for you. So, we can now push the summations inside. So, what have we done? We have taken the original question that we were interested in and converted into a factorization with some summations inside and summations will always be over hidden variables. 
now we need to do this computation so you can write a computation graph for it so in this case i am showing you the computation graph if i want to compute the probability of b uh, uh, for true so i will multiply probability of b true then i will uh, sum over e so this is a sum node then here p of e here p of not e given that e is true what is the probability of a given b e uh, and not a given b e because i am going to sum over a so that's a sum node and then j given a m given a j given not a m given not a and so on so so if you want you can just take like a recursive equation and keep you know uh, recur, uh, doing the recursion and keep computing it with sum nodes and product nodes so every path is product and this is a sum now we can observe one thing what do we observe same, same calculation is being repeated where on the left we have j a m a and on the left here also we have j a m a here we have j not a m not a here we have j not a m not a i am doing this computation again and again i am being redundant so whenever you have this situation where your computation graph is making redundant computations and this is a general algorithmic principle i don't know if you have done a course on algorithms or not but this is the one of the most generic principles that whenever you have the same computation getting repeated many many times what do you do you store its value and this algorithm is called dynamic programming if you don't know what dynamic programming is i encourage you to go read up about it this is outside the purview of this course okay ai is an algorithmic field so it sits on top of all the algorithmic principles but this is a general principle when we do repeated computations the algorithm is called dynamic programming and um the algorithm which does dynamic programming for computing inference for performing inference in bayesian network is called variable elimination okay so variable elimination uses the word factor a factor is a function where some set of variables have specific values like a factor of e a n1 that would be a factor of the variable e a variable a and the variable n1 right and it will have some uh, value some conditional probability tables are factors for example p of a given eb is a function of a e and b variable elimination works by eliminating all variables in turn eliminating the hidden variables eliminating the variables that we are summing over because once we sum over them they have been eliminated and again if it's not clear the next slide will make it clearer and so eliminate the variable you join all the factors and then you sum out the variable that you are interested in okay and so let us look at one simple example and then we'll look at another example and we'll go over this example carefully so let's say i want to compute probability a priori probability that john is going to call we can simply use all the magic that we have so that is sum over all variables probability of j m a b e all other variables now the joint can be written down as product so we write it down as product and then we send the um variables inside in some order so we send the variables inside like this okay now now comes your question if i look at this thing in the blue sum over e probability of a given b e into probability of e what is this a function over which variables is it a function over is it a function over a b and e yes or no come on this is not a very hard question sum over e probability of a given b e times probability of e it's a function of a and b is it a function of e no because e has been summed over so e does not exist anymore at this point so this becomes a function of a and b now sum over b probability of b times f1 of a a comma b that's a function over a f2 of a now sum over m m given a times f2 of a that is a function over it's a function over a because m has been summed so sum over a probability of j given a f3 of a that's a function of j and it should have been a function of j because that is what we originally wanted to compute in the first place now you can see how the variable elimination algorithm is working it linearizes it creates a sequence of these computations and just keeps going back 
and at every point it is computing this table which is a function over some configurations of some variables to a number and then it multiplies something it adds something then it becomes takes a new function then it multiplies and each of this function is called a factor. And we are going to do this for our particular example which is probability of b probability of e probability of a given e b j a m a summed over e and a and we will basically compute everything in the red in one step. So, this was the original condition probability table for j given a m given a. Now, I need to compute the probability of small j given a times probability of small m given a. First question what is it a function over? Because small j is given to me small m is given to me those are constants. What is it a function over? a. So, I will have two different values one for a true and one for a false. What is the value going to be for a true carefully? What is the value going to be for probability a true? We will be multiplying two numbers right <coughs> because we have to compute probability of j given a times probability of m given a. So, what is probability of j given a for a true? What is the probability that John will call if there is alarm? 0 0.9. What is the probability that Mary will call if there is alarm? 0 0.7. So, you get 0 0.9 times 0 0.7. Similarly, what will be the other number? It will be a product of 0 0.05 times 0 0.01. Let us call this new function that we have created f 1 and now that value for f 1 is 0 0.63 and 0 0.0005. Now, you can see how variable elimination algorithm is working. So, the next thing we have to do is we need to do sum over a probability of a given e comma b times f 1 of a. Now, just to make it easier for you I have written down the CPT for a and the f 1 of a. First question thing in the red what is it a function of? b and e because I am summing over a right. So, now give me one value and I will be happy ok. So, what will be the value here the full computation for e is true and b is true earthquake has happened and burglary has happened or will happen whatever true true. Tell me what is the computation that I will have for this for e true b true ok. So, let us look at the first term let us say the first term is a is true, second term will be a is false and we will be adding the two terms or multiplying the two terms, adding the two terms very good. So, what will be the first term a is true, what will be the term 0 0.95 times 0 0.63 and what will be the second term now a is false, but e and b are true 0 0.05 times 0 0.3. 0, 0, 0, 0, that gives you one such term. Similarly, we can check the next one quickly E b bar E b bar will be 0 0.29 into 0 0.63 plus 0 0.71 into 0 0.0005 0, 0, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Let us call this function f 2 and this is its value I have done the computation for you. So, next step let us say I will do it in one step. So, we now compute the remaining part. So, remaining part is sum over e all of everything in the red how much is that? What is it a function of? Because e has been summed away it will be a function of b and again in this function of b I will have two terms one for e true one for e false and it will be a product of how many terms each term will be a product of how many terms? 3 terms f 2 p of e and p of b. So, you can do this you will have 3 terms multiplied like 0 0.6 times 0 0.001 times 0 0.002 similarly 0 0.59 times 0 0.998 times 0 0.001 and so on. And you do this you get now the final function f 3 of b. Now, that is alpha times f 3 of b. 
Now, we need to go from alpha f3 of b to probability distribution, probability of burglary given John called and Mary called. Now, what is this property of probability function? It should sum to 1. Does this table sum to 1? No. What do we do? Just normalize. So, my normalization constant is 0 0.0019. I divide each number by this number and that I finally get my final probability distribution. This is how you do inference in a Bayesian network using variable elimination. It is not complicated at all. However, because they are numbers, you have to be slightly careful, especially if you are doing it in an exam. A calculator always helps. In general, your computer will be doing it, so you just have to make sure you code it right. And out of curiosity, this is a homework for you. Go home and stare at this and say, huh, so John called and Mary called, but burglar is only 30 percent probable. Why? I am not asking you for an answer, something for you to think about. Go back, look at the conditional probability tables, to scratch your head, look at intermediate computation and see if you can get an intuitive sense of why it was only a third probable and not much more probable. You would have hoped that if John has called and Mary has called, there has been a burglary, but it only says there is a burglary uh, one in three times. All right. Let that be it, that is because of the specific condition probability table. So, you will you will figure this out. So, just some notes, each operation is a simple multiplication of factors and summing out a variable. Complexity of variable elimination unfortunately is determined, uh, so what is it determined on? So, if you think about it, in our specific example, the biggest computation we did was here. We looked at E, B and A and A terms. So, it was dependent on the complexity of the factor. The largest factor here was 2 to the power 3, not 2 to the power 5. So, even though we were summing 32 numbers, we did not do a, a 2 to the 5 amount of computation, we only did 2 to the 3 amount of computation based on what was the biggest factor that we had to consider. So, in general, <coughs> it is exponential in the largest factor that gets created and it can change from linear to exponential sometimes if you do not choose your order right, if you do not choose the order of elimination correctly. So, therefore, order of elimination makes a world of difference in making variable elimination good or a bad algorithm. Unfortunately, optimal elimination orderings are NP hard, not surprising, this is a hard problem and then there are many heuristics that people consider. So, in general variable elimination is not a polynomial time algorithm, that is the point I am trying to make. In the worst case, it can be 2 to the power n if the largest factor that gets created is 2 to the n sized. And that is just life, uh, very soon I am going to show you that it is a problem in a hard complexity class. So, it has to be exponential, there is no magic here, but in practice sometimes variable elimination is much better and then there are many other approximate inference algorithms that have been developed which can be faster and one of that we will do in the next class which will be important for you for I believe your assignment.